Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Big Bout Podcast. This is John Suntress. Fun conversation today with uh, William Detloff, the editor of Ringside Seat and the author of a great Ezra Charles bi- biography called Ezra Charles A Boxing Life. Uh, it's interesting because uh, we're going to be talking uh, about that and also um, the recent Canelo Alvarez fight. Uh, lots of conversation with Bill Detloff. But first, I wanted to acknowledge... Uh, the HBO Ali documentary, the coda to HBO boxing, I suppose. Filmmaker Anton Fuqua's Muhammad Ali, What's My Name? Uh, two parts, a tremendous documentary. I have to say that uh, Fuqua assembled some amazing archival footage in a fresh way because, as most of us being fight fans, I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff, and really, we know the story. We've known the story for years, especially if you're an older fight fan. And even young fat fight fans certainly are aware of the greatness of Muhammad Ali and then seek it out. Thankfully, with things like YouTube, you not only get to see a lot of the great fights, but you also get to see uh, a lot of the interviews that Ali did over the years, documentaries that have been made over the years. So at first, when you hear, oh, they're going to do another Ali documentary, you know, there's kind of a reflex of again. You know, isn't there already enough, you know, material out there, certainly after Ali's death? Um, and I, again, a great subject, and I'm really happy that uh, Fuqua has proved me wrong and made a very entertaining three-hour documentary that um, really does a great job in chronicling Ali's life and career and personal side and achievements outside of the ring. It was fantastic. The smallest nitpick I have, and really infinitesimal. I don't mean to do this, but I guess uh, this is my uh, nerd side coming out, but I would have liked to have seen a few more seconds devoted to the Ali-Doug Jones fight because I think it's the most interesting pre-title fight that Ali ever had. And I think that there is a a small bit of controversy at the time that uh, people thought Doug Jones won. I also know that uh, Ali obviously never uh, thought about a rematch with Jones and that may not have been in the cards. Um, So I thought that was kind of interesting. But again, ridiculously smallest nitpick. That said, I think um, also I really appreciated the assemblage of a lot of the highlights of uh, the fights of Ali. But sometimes highlight uh, footage can be deceptive the, the way it's edited. For instance, the second Ali Frazier fight, which I never thought was a close fight, watching the full fight as I have in the past, um, I thought it was interesting. I thought uh, it looked a little closer uh, the way that uh, Fuqua presented it. Also, that interesting early uh, part of was it the second round? Raleigh almost knocked Frazier out, but Tony Perez uh, signaled that the, the round was over. I mean, he really had Frazier in trouble, and you saw a couple of those punches that rocked Frazier, but you didn't see him when uh, Ali had him trapped in the corner. And uh, there's a reason why Ali always had it in for uh, Tony Perez over the years. There was that. There was calling um, the Wepner knockdown that uh, Wepner had of Ali when he stepped on his foot, calling it a knockdown. So, yeah, I mean, and of course... Um, Perez uh, sued Ali for defamation of character uh, after his complaints about that. But uh, that said, the other one, man, I'll tell you, you know who uh, owes Anton Fuqua a steak dinner? Leon Spinks. Taking nothing away from Leon. I like Leon. I got to know Leon in the early 90s as his career was winding down and he was still fighting. Um, The highlights they showed of Ali Spinks won. Man, I'll tell you, they cut that into looking much more dynamic then it actually spills out if you watch the full fight. And, uh, I mean, granted, Leon was the busier fighter, and I'm not saying what we saw wasn't true, but, uh, you know, you really uh, didn't appreciate how little Ali did uh, if you watched the 15 rounds. It's my problem with the the, um, contender on reality TV. Uh, the way they cut uh, rounds as opposed to showing full fights, or at least they used to. I have to confess I haven't watched the show since it's been on Epics. But that always bothered me back when it was on NBC. I'm like, I I really, I I thought for, if anything, this was going to be the first uh, reality show involving sports where you would see a reality side to it, but also, uh, you know, the, the actual event. I mean, show us the full fight, for God's sakes. And that always disappointed me about The Contender. But back to Ali, um, another thing, all the Ali versus Holmes footage, great pre-fight footage. I've seen that Merv Griffin interview before, but all this other random stuff. Uh, Also, I really think Anton Fuqua did a Holmes a real solid, showing uh, the exceptional highlights of Larry Holmes' career and uh, how noble he was in beating Ali. And um, 
that's that's really great because I think a lot of people are going to look at that and realize um, how, how how great of a champion Larry Holmes was and uh, the tough act to follow that he had to in in uh, you know after uh, the Great Ali uh, era and and obviously you can't help but compare it. Um, I always think Larry gets a raw deal, and I think most fight fans and fight experts agree with that, that Larry does get a raw deal. He really was one of the most exceptional heavyweight champions of all time and uh, did everything he could to beat the heavyweights of his era. And, God, I'm glad not only did they show the the Norton fight, um, but also all those fights of of, uh, Holmes leading up to that Norton fight. Um, He was a great fighter and a great champion. So, again, I think... uh, there's another guy that uh, owes, uh, owes our, uh, Antoine Fuqua, Fuqua another uh, steak dinner. But uh, another great champion that uh, doesn't get his due because of the era that uh, he uh, succeeded is, of course, Ezra Charles. And uh, we get into this conversation with Bill Detloff talking about uh, Ezra Charles and also the Canelo fight and a whole lot more. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I like talking to Bill and uh, others from Ringside Seat. And I think on the Big Bow podcast, you're going to have guys like that. And, of course, my guy Doug Fisher from Ring Magazine. I'm looking forward to another conversation with him. But uh, from the beginning, when I first uh, contacted Bill Detloff, I wanted to talk to him about his Ezra Charles biography because Charles is a fascinating champion, doesn't get his due. Um, I think fought in in one of the most difficult eras in that post-Joe Lewis and and pre-Marciano era. And the guy just doesn't get... Uh, the credit he deserves. Certainly not at light heavyweight, as Bill and I discuss. And uh, yes, you can argue that Ezra Charles might have been the greatest light heavyweight ever. Yes, greater than Archie Moore. Uh, Yes, greater than Michael Spanks. Yes, greater than Billy Kahn. And again, all of this is covered in our conversation. So I hope you enjoy it. William Detloff, ringside seats, editor-in-chief, talking about Ezra Charles and the current fight game on the Big Bout Podcast. Bill Detloff, welcome back to the Big Bout Podcast. Great to have you back, man. Uh, thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be back. I was uh, doing my usual social media trolling, and I not troll the uh, gentle fisherman trolling way, and not the. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm with you, and, and not the angry shaking my fist at the internet uh, way and everything. But yeah, I noticed that uh, you had a great feature on uh, last weekend's Canelo uh, uh, Jacobs fight. Thank you. And, and yeah, no, and and I mean honestly, well, and it kind of dovetailed into what I also wanted to talk to you about today because um, I, I liked your conclusion, and I'll let you you go into detail on it. But you know that Canel seems to do enough to win, and that's just great. I mean, but unfortunately, on these pay per views where you want more action and stuff, it's I, I found it frustrating. I, I assume that you found it frustrating as well. Hmm. Uh, I didn't. Or how do you assess? I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah I wasn't you know, frustrated. Yeah. I was. Yeah, I was. I would say uh, mildly disappointed. Okay. That he didn't try harder to impress, and I guess there are two things we're talking about uh, with Canelo in terms of his performance against Jacobs and his last couple. I think. <clears throat> Excuse me, but before I even get to that, I want to say that uh, Canelo is a hell of a fighter. Like this yes, guy indeed. really knows how to fight. He's very, very good. And what's interesting about um, what he's doing now. Uh, to me, as the biggest star in the sport, is that he's not um, uh, blasting people out of the ring. If you look at uh, the greatest legends and heroes from boxing and the biggest draws of their day, it's usually killers, right? Jack Dempsey or Mike Tyson or or Ray Leonard at one time, right? When people think of Leonard as a boxer, but he was a killer in there. Oh, yeah. La Jolla and and Manny Pacquiao, like the biggest um, draws have uh, been the guys who were best at, um, you know, rattling their opponent's brain stems, right? Yeah. But um, yeah. that kind of that changed uh, with Floyd Mayweather, right? right. Um, and then immediately almost on Floyd's heels, we get Canelo, who kind of looks the part physically. Like he looks like he really wants to hurt guys in here, but because he's, you know, he's built like that and he's got the, you know, the – a no neck thing going on in the big shoulders, but he's not really a big puncher. <laughs> he's not really a big puncher unless you know he's uh, he's really there's a really a significant talent gap between him and his opponent, right? He's perfectly willing just to box and counter and never, as I wrote in uh, my fight um, report, never really get out of first gear. And if he can win doing that, and apparently he can, um, then he's very happy with that. And that that's interesting to me. 
again, not only that he's such, he, he's the biggest uh, star in the sport fighting that way, but also that he feels no um, urgency to uh, to do more than he absolutely has to. Especially, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Continue. Especially, especially in view of the fact that uh, many thought and continue to think, as I do, that he lost or they should have lost officially both his bouts with Gennady Golovkin. I feel the same way. Um, I would add uh, maybe Lennox Lewis is another guy who, once he settled into his uh, heavyweight championship, did enough to win. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, every now and then he would uh, – Haseem Rockman would get him angry. And so, mm-hmm. he'd, you know, he'd, he'd take care of him in the rematch. Um, but, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's a good thing. And, I and uh, you know, I boy, this is the struggle with boxing – being a you know a blood sport the the negative term to describe it and everything um yeah i i don't know man it kind of it did it it disappointed me as well and and um especially when it seems like to to set up a to set up a a fight with uh canelo and with uh golden boy representing him and stuff man i mean it's one thing to have things to your advantage but it just really seems like every contract is like well, let's, you know, I mean, God, that, that ridiculous thing that Danny Jacobs had to hit 170 the day after the weigh-in. And it's like, well, look, man, if the guy made it, you know, it, the, the weigh-ins are the day before, they are what they are. I mean, I, I certainly know, and, and you're well aware, that, that fighters do come in significantly heavier uh, uh, fight day if they're allowed to have 24 hours before the weigh-in. Um, and I also think that, yeah, Canelo's the guy who stepped up in weight. I'm not convinced he can hit at middleweight, frankly. I mean, he's he's fast, and he definitely can counter. I, I don't know. It just it, it seemed to me that um, it was his speed and not his power that was fr- frustrating Danny Jacobs. And I'm kind of still not convinced, as you say, too, because I think Triple G won those two fights. And so I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of Canelo as a, as a middleweight. I agree with you. I think, I think he's talented as hell. But, um, you know, he chose to uh, fight at this uh, higher weight class. And, um, yeah, I'm just seeing I'm, – I'm seeing a, a fast little guy. I mean, and he's not the first. There's, there's certainly been other fighters that have fought above their heads and, and succeeded. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, can you make sense of my gobbledygook right now? Well, certainly. And, and to an extent, <laughs> I agree with it. I think he, he – I think he, I think he hits plenty hard, which is part of the problem uh, for his opponents. For, and and even at middleweight, I think he hits plenty hard because look what he did to Rocky Fielding in his last fight before Jacobs, and that was a sure. super weight, right? That's true. That's true. And um, it was he that was coming forward against Golovkin in their second fight, right? And he sure, yeah. he sure seemed to um, bother Gennady with his pressure. So he's certainly strong enough. And I think at this weight, getting back to the uh, the contract requirement uh, concerning Jacob's rehydration, that didn't bother me because uh, the big draw always, or I should say the A side, for as long as boxing has been around and uh, subject to uh, conditions in a contract, the A side always uh, things like that to uh, get any advantage that he can, right? Uh, whether it's a, a weight stipulation or. Uh, glove size or ring size or location. Size, sure. All those things happen all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, and that's what the A-sides and the stars in boxing have always done. They take advantage of uh, everything that they can. So I don't blame them for that either. If Jacob okay. didn't, you know, didn't want to go along, but they didn't have to have the fight. That's True. that's not the point of view I would take, but that's, you know, that's, this is part of boxing. But um, I think uh, Canelo hits plenty hard. Um, I think, again, that he's only interested in demonstrating that or knocking guys out when there's this really significant talent gap, like there wasn't a fielding fight. It wasn't as uh, demonstrative in the Jacobs fight, which is why he never uh, seemed especially interested in uh, in knocking Jacobs out. I think he certainly hits hard enough. And again, this is a problem for his opponents. He, he hits hard enough so that and is very good and is good enough at counterpunching that he shuts down their offense. Right. If, if if there's one way to uh, reduce your opponent's willingness to engage, it's to make sure that he loses every exchange. Right. He wants to keep <laughs> his hands at home. And this sure. might be a bad example, but I think back to the to uh, Canelo's fight with uh, Chavez Jr., who yes. essentially refused to throw punches the entire fight because he found out early in the fight that whenever he did that, he was going to get slammed. 
Good point. And, yeah. And you yeah. You have to have a certain amount of power to make a guy say, I'm just going to stop punching because I don't like getting hit with that kind of power. So uh, I think I think he and that's what kind of what's troubling about him in a little bit. He does hit hard enough to hurt guys and he's really a really slick boxer. And so with his physical talent and his tools, it's a little annoying uh, to see him not um, tr- what it looks like to uh, fans and that's in the media to try to try harder. Yeah, it looks like he's I guess it looks like he's not trying and it's almost he's, frustrating because to be that good and not try as uh, hard as you absolutely can to make a fight exciting is slightly frustrating. But from a scientific standpoint, I kind of enjoyed the fight because we're seeing two high level boxers. But, uh, you know, the fan side of me also wants to see a little bloodshed, if I can help. That's why I'm watching yeah. the fights. Right? Well, you're right. And, and I mean, you know, it's uh, – yeah, that it almost looks too easy for Canelo uh, in terms of his t- his level of talent. And mm-hmm. and I suppose you're right. And I'm glad you bring up the Chavez Jr. fight um, because I, I think you're right. Although, you know, Chavez is his own pile of uh, right. psychoses right. And, and the yep. things that are – Compelling him to fight or not fight and everything. Right. So I, exactly but right. I, but but no, I hear what you're saying, and, I'm, and that's a that's a fair point. But um, I just felt that when Jacobs did, as you point out in your in your coverage, in that second half of the fight, you know, when he when he chose to fight, he was effective. And I and again, I think it was. I'm not sure what was keeping uh, Danny Jacobs from really getting going. And again, it, it may just be as simple as his offense, uh, Canelo's offense uh, in his face, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was, I, I really was. I was expecting a much tougher fight um, because I, I think D- Danny Jacobs, rightfully so, is probably the third best middleweight right now. Yeah, so I he think had number one against number three, and you know, again, the the two tough fights with uh, with Golovkin and everything. Uh, yeah, I was, I was surprised at how easy it was for Canelo. And again, a lot of that it goes to the fault of Jacobs for either not getting started faster or again just being frustrated by Canelo's offense. And not only his offense, but his defense as well. I think there's there's sure. nothing more frustrating uh, to a fighter than not being able to hit the other guy. As long as you can land once in a while, you don't even have to hurt the other guy. If you can land, then landing is fun, and it keeps you in the fight as long as you can land. You might get you might cut the guy or something or mm-hmm. something like that. But when you can't even land a, a punch, if you throw a seven punch combination and miss every punch, that's why that's frustrating. And then you're getting hit with hard, stiff counters on top of that. And uh, Jacobs is not uh, not a freewheeling type of puncher to begin with, right? He's fairly conservative. So uh, those things considered, and also when a, when a guy who is not known um, for being passive is suddenly passive to the degree that Jacobs was, you have to uh, give credit to the guy, the other guy in the ring yeah. with him for making him that way. And that's, that goes to Canelo's credit, in my view. But it's still frustrating that, um, wow, he is super talented and super good. Just kick it up a little bit. Let's yeah. Kick it up a little. yeah, no, I hear you, man. And I, and again, I, I think your uh, your article's great. It's free. I'll, I'll uh, throw a link up on uh, Big Thank Bob you. Podcast. Absolutely, man. Well, and it's a it's a good calling card for for the coverage you guys provided uh, ringside seat for that matter. Thanks. So bigger middleweight picture. Uh, you know, I mean, we do have every promoter. God, they're really we're embarrassed with how many good middleweights there are right now. To the point where. I think most of these promoters can safely uh, promote their fighters and have them fight decent fights, yep. you know, within their own fiefdoms of promotional, you know, uh, promoters and everything, and not have to, you know, uh, Al Heyman and Bob Arum don't have to make a deal necessarily right. to get a good middleweight fight. So that's good on on the one hand, but then on the other hand too, yeah, we're really, you know, we're stuck with possibly one of the best uh, middleweight divisions in in decades. In terms of, I think talent and mm-hmm. competition, but yeah, sure. that that we may not see them fight each other as we would in, in the old days. Well, that's true. It's, it seems to be the case in most every division, or at least in yeah. the, the glamour divisions, as it were. Um, here's the thing about Canelo that we should be happy about, by the way. Um, the guy will fight anybody. Okay, <laughs> the guy's he will. Well, any- but but every fighter says that, man. I don't know. I mean, no, I, I mean, don't but, doubt it, but you know, right? But 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 look at his resume. Look at the guys he's fought. Yeah, he's not he's not ducking anybody. Uh, he True. fought Golovkin twice, um, and lots of guys don't want to get near Golovkin even now. I think. And um, for the record, I see a lot of people aren't really interested in a third Golovkin fight, but I certainly would be. They oh, both were both uh, were really entertaining. Who, who, are uh, fans fights. saying that? I, I mean, I'm shocked to hear that actually. Yeah, I, I've seen some uh, conversation on, in social huh. media that uh, people would rather see him fight other people. 
or rather people would rather see Golovkin fight other opponents besides or rather not Golovkin Canelo fight opponents uh, besides Golovkin but I'd certainly be willing to watch a third fight between them the first two were pretty good absolutely uh, and man. Certainly at a very high level right yeah, yeah. Canelo, if you Go look on. at Canelo's record he'll fight anybody he's fought everybody there is to fight and True. um and at, at his level and again uh the top star in boxing he's fighting three times a year at least maybe four good point absolutely and also was willing was right. willing was willing to fight Mayweather when you know uh, it was I mean again nobody goes into a fight to lose but mm-hmm. at least I mean that's so rare because I mean right. God that's like uh, back when Mancini fought Alex Cesar Guayo and everything and it's like <laughs> right, right. you know I'm gonna I'm gonna lose this fight but I'm certainly gonna learn a lot in the process and everything right. exactly right not quite ready uh, for that uh, big picture yet but sure he fought him and uh, he's done pretty well for himself since so uh, I like Canelo a lot and I think he's a hell of a good fighter and. Uh, it's just slightly frustrating in terms of uh, the pace at which he fights. And uh, but if that's the worst thing you can say about the guy, hey, that's not I'm with you. Yeah, fair enough. And no, like you said, he talented as hell, and I and I do enjoy watching him. I I will. I think I'll be better convinced as he continues to plow through the division. And you know, I mean, who? So who? I mean, obviously we've got Triple G. Who really is worthy of a Canelo fight that is an easy fight? for uh, DAZN and Matchmaker and, and Golden Boy to do? You know what? I try not to get uh, too mired in um, this contractual promotional things. Okay. Right? And I know who the players are. I know who the promoters are. It's Aram and Hearn and, Hearn and those guys. Sure. But uh, when people start talking about uh, the rosters and how who can't fight who, I kind of uh, – my eyes glaze over and I don't really listen. But there are, there are plenty of middleweights that I wouldn't mind seeing uh, – Canelo fight. Virtually any middleweight I'd, I'd like to see Canelo fight, but I think at the top of my list certainly would be a, a, a third fight with Golovkin. Yeah, okay. I mean, and, and I guess um, yeah, my, my concern is, and obviously we, you've, you, we've touched on it by mentioning the flat fact that you could say it's about the other glamour divisions. Man, I, w- fortunes change so fast in boxing, and it really sure. did seem like we were lucky uh, to get good matchups and good fights, for that matter. Um you know, about a year and a half ago, and then about six months ago, we really got a bunch of stinkers. And uh, as far as or or a willingness to fight each other, and again, I mean, that's why I I, I salute Canelo for being willing to fight uh, Floyd Mayweather when he did. Mm-hmm, um, sure. I mean, it 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 seemed like maybe the promoters understood that keeping a fighter undefeated isn't the be all end all, and that you might have to risk something to really. Get known. Thank God for those Muhammad Ali uh, uh, tournaments uh, for the Muhammad Ali Trophy in the various non glamour divisions, where we right, are getting right. some great matchups and spectacular fights. I mean, good lord, it's been fun watching Nonito Denaire. Uh, Absolutely, he, you know, come have his second coming. And man, he reminds me, wasn't it? Daryl Daniel Zaragoza was like one of those great tiny uh, fighters that all of a sudden at thirty five was just kicking ass. Yes. And it's just like Jesus, look at that man. That's great. I mean, most guys are done at that at that age, you know, when they're that light and stuff. And no need to deny just you know, clean taking care of business and uh, wiping guys out. It's it, I've I've enjoyed that in the bantamweight division. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. Uh, you might recall from our last uh, discussion that I love a puncher. And, sure. Uh, Who doesn't Anita love was a puncher? Not, Come on. Right, right. <laughs> if, if he's anything, uh, he's a puncher. It's probably fortunate for him that uh, the guy he was scheduled to fight pulled out with an injury True. and he got this late late replacement uh, who was not really a world beater. Um, so uh, I will celebrate every victory uh, that he can come up with at this point in his career and hope that he continues to starch guys. But I'm not expecting anything long term from him. But just to get back to your uh, question before that, there's some there's some good uh, fights at middleweight for Canelo. That have been talked about already. Demetrius Andre, of course, is a good yes. fight. <clears throat> I'd love to see him fight uh, Jamal Charlo. That'd be interesting. Sure. Um, okay. uh, David Lemieux, I think, would be an interesting – well, I'm sorry. No, yeah, David Lemieux would be an interesting fight for a couple of rounds because uh, it's unlikely that Lemieux would be able to land his big left hook without um, getting uh, pummeled in the, in the interim. But it would be interesting to see what would happen if he could land that big left hook on uh, Canelo. Um but there are uh, a few middleweights out there that uh, I'd still like to see Canelo against in addition to uh, Golovkin. Fair enough. No, absolutely. Saunders obviously would generate a nice gate. You know uh, what? That's I think, is a very interesting fight for Saunders. Yeah. And, and people like to make fun of him. And I kind of get that because he's, you know, he's a little wacky. 
<laughs> and he's inconsistent. But man, when he's on his game and he's in shape and motivated, that dude can box. There you go. I could no. see him giving uh, Canelo a very interesting fight. I just don't know if he can hold it together long enough to get that big shot. But man, he's a real interesting fighter. When he's on and uh, interested, wow, he's very good. I almost saw, and uh, touching in uh, your, your book about Ezra Charles, I almost saw a through line in terms of exactly what you were talking about with Canelo. Um, that uh, certainly, especially when Ezra was making the transition from light heavyweight to heavyweight, uh, people were saying the same. It sounded like people were saying the same things about Ezra Charles, that uh, a couple of his early wins uh, at heavyweight and everything, you know, people were like, oh, he should have tried, even the first Walcott fight. Um, that, you know, yeah, he, he should have tried harder. How come he didn't finish him? You know? Yeah, well, it was a whole, yeah. Um, the response is the same, but it's a whole different set, different set of circumstances with Ezard. Because uh, when he moved up to heavyweight, he was fighting really big guys that he knew could, that he knew could hurt him. Okay, so we changed his whole um, style in the ring. Uh, a good analogy, I think, that is unfortunate for Ezard uh, is, I think, um, Michael Moore. Remember when Michael Moore sure. was a light heavyweight? Yes. He was a beast. Yes. Right? He was just killing people. Unstoppable. Absolutely. Yeah. And for a little while, he was like that at heavyweight when he fought Burt Cooper and, and uh, Mike the Giant White and a couple of sure. – and maybe even Alex Stewart, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, he was he, – you could see he got rattled because his chin wasn't great at heavyweight, but he was still a killer, right? Right. But then it just completely went out of him. And uh, remember his awful fights with Vaughn Bean – and the Holdfield fight was awful. It just became yes. so passive. Yes. And, um, so I think that's kind of what happened to Ezard, who, who really started as a middleweight pro, then right. went to light heavyweight and couldn't get a couldn't get a title shot at light heavyweight, so went to heavyweight. Um, so he started at a, a weight class lower than Moore did. But I think Moore probably I don't know whether he was just eating well, so he was, he lost his uh, anger when he got became a heavyweight. I'm talking about Moore here, right, Michael Moore, whether, yeah. right, or whether he just was um, more cautious because the big guys could hurt him. Where I don't think anybody touched him at light heavyweight or or um, hurt him badly. Except maybe for wow, Frankie Swindell. <laughs> a, uh, very good. One. Remember him? <laughs> Frankie I do Swindell. remember Frankie Swindell. That's awesome, yeah. man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Frankie Swindell hurt Michael Moore in their light heavyweight fight, but I can't remember any other light heavyweights hurting Moore. And Moore just ravaged and savaged him after that. Man, but, there's, um, a, there's a good reason to go through YouTube and then start looking at go. Michael Moore light heavyweight yeah. fights, and, and you forget yeah. how – you're right, man. You forget how dominant he was at, at – yeah. you know, and wasn't – wasn't considered the best. I mean, he had the WBO title, right. but man was tearing through everybody they put in front of him. You're right. Yeah, I would have liked to see him against Virgil Hill. That would have Indeed. been interesting. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I top, uh, top the, light again, heavyweight. Yeah, top yeah. top light heavyweight, consummate boxer. Uh, yep. You know the number the number one uh, draw in Bismarck, North Dakota. Of there course. you go. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. <laughs> God, how many Saturday afternoons on Wide World of Sports yep. are we watching a Vir- Virgil Hill title defense? That's fantastic, exactly right. Man. Exactly right. You're killing me. See, this is why. This is why I enjoyed boxing. <laughs> you know, back in my twenties and everything. This is this is what made it great. Absolutely, man. No, I really enjoyed your uh, your Ezra Charles, Charles book, and it, it's fascinating. And it, and also that per, that period. Um, but well, first of all, all three. I mean, you know, well, really, I guess you could say four acts of a of a, of a uh, boxing career because you're right. His his young days as a middleweight, mm-hmm. his his dominance at light heavyweight, uh, going for and having the title uh, at heavyweight, and then of course the the post title years that were certainly a struggle and mm-hmm. got the amount of fights that the guy had too uh, after after losing the title and everything. So. Uh, and and just yeah, it's just a, a, a sad story. I mean, you know, doesn't doesn't necessarily end well. And um, you know, uh, but but fascinating because it was during that whole IBC control of boxing period, and just when that that immediate time right after Joe Lewis decides to retire, and you know, uh, they they come up with the scheme to kind of hold on to the title in air quotes. Uh, the you know uh, Jim. Uh, Jim Jacobs, not Jim Jacobs. Uh, Mike Jacobs. Mike Jacobs. Well, Mike Jacobs turning it over to Jim Norris and right. Arthur Wirtz and the IBC. And, I mean, that's a Chicago story as well for me because uh, they were based in Chicago. And uh, yep. Arthur Wirtz, uh, uh, um, Jim Norris's uh, partner as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, fascinating stuff, man. So, uh, no, I, and I think you get, you get into great detail not only the moves – 
uh, that Charles's people had to to keep him active and everything, and the support he got from the IBC, but also the reaction around uh, around the sport, and 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 also, man, we think you know things were so smooth right. back back in the old days, but as you point out, that was the IBC making their moves. And uh, the WBA's uh, predecessor, the NBA, the National mm-hmm. Boxing Association, they weren't crazy about the idea of the tournament creating a champion. The British weren't excited about it. New York wasn't excited about right. it. So, yeah, fascinating. Uh, you know, as much as things change, they stay the same. Exactly right. We, we uh, So many of us look back on that time as a golden age of boxing, and wow, it was probably more corrupt than it is today. <laughs> And well, I'm Bert, not, Bert Sugar I'm, always I'm not, used to say the mob used to run it better than than you know the knuckleheads that run it today, and and you can argue that they kind of did. You know, everybody certainly. fought each other, so you know. Right, and you, you know how you can tell uh, that a fighter in that age was controlled and connected to the mob, controlled by and connected to the mob. Tell me, you know how you can tell they had big fights. Fair enough, they yeah, got big man. fights because yeah. they wouldn't have gotten big fights if if they hadn't been. Sure. And that and that includes those of Charles, sure. Tom Tannis. Tom Tannis, who was um, Charles's manager after the Cincinnati businessmen, um, Ryan, Elkis, and Dyer, were mm-hmm. bought out, quote-unquote, uh, from their contract. Uh, Tannis uh, was a mafia-connected guy who took over Charles's, uh, the management of Charles's career uh, and bought the contract out from those guys. And uh, he was completely connected to the mob. And um, uh, Jersey Joel Walkpat's uh, manager was – complete mob guy frankie carbo and blinky palermo were mob guys uh, the manager's guild was just a front for mob guys uh, absolutely um and if you didn't uh if your manager quote-unquote wasn't part of the manager's guild you weren't getting big fights that's all there is to it i said so all our heroes from the from that era all of them if they were in big fights and we wouldn't heard of them otherwise if they were in big fights they were connected to the mob to some degree or another and that includes by the way joe lewis yeah, I'm not saying his fights were fixed necessarily, but his contract was cut into so many pieces and so many people owned pieces of him. It's impossible that some of them weren't gangsters. Absolutely impossible. If you're in it, big fights in that era, you were controlled by the mob. And, and uh, sadly, too, that, you know, uh, the Cinderella man himself, Jim Braddock, was uh, sure. making a yep. lot of money off of Joe Lewis uh, post. And in fact, you guys had that in uh, a recent uh, issue of uh, Ringside, correct? Yes, Don Stradley wrote a great piece um, about uh, um, very suggestive ties that uh, Braddock's manager had with known gangsters at the time. It's just the, it's just the way it worked. You know, when, when people think back at that time, they think of guys like Primo Carnero who were obviously moved by the mob in, sure. uh, in a famous story. But it was everybody because if you didn't hear these guys, you – because. Guys weren't guys. Guys just weren't getting fights unless they were tied to the mob in some in some way or paying the mob to some degree. No, I understand. What what made you want to do a biography of Ezra Charles? Um, I got the idea when when my uh, old editor at the Ring, the great Nigel Collins, um, assigned me a section to write a, a piece about uh, ranking the greatest light heavyweights ever. Mm-hmm. And, um, I expected going into it that I would arrive on Archie Moore. Or maybe even Michael Spinks or Billy sure. Conner, those guys who were sure. well-known light heavyweights. Uh, but as I looked through the old records and um, saw who beat whom or whom beat who, I don't forget how it should be now. <laughs> <Sorry>. um, <laughs> the guy who – the light heavyweight who had uh, the most wins on his record against other great, uh, objectively great light heavyweights was Ezra Charles, who had wins over um, – three wins over Archie Moore. One by knockout ones over Jimmy Bivens and Charlie Burley and Johnny Maxim and Lloyd Marshall and so many members of the so-called Black Murderers Row. I said, "Wow, nobody! How come nobody calls this guy the greatest light heavyweight champion ever?" Um, so, uh, so it was a list of twenty fighters, and he arrived uh, at the top of my list. And um, while I was researching, I kept looking for a book on uh, him because I figured there had to be one because there are. There are many books on Joe Lewis, of course, of course. and Rocky Marciano. There was even one a few years ago on Joe Walcott that came out, and there was one on Jimmy Bivens. But I couldn't find one on uh, – there wasn't there wasn't any biography wow. on Ezra Charles. And I said, That's, how can that be? And so I said, that, uh, why don't I just write one? And so I did. That's how I arrived at Ezra Charles. That's great, man. You know, um, I had I had an opportunity to call in on a, a radio talk show 
that Howard Cosell was on in the really er, yeah in the in the I want to get this right I know it was in the eighties it was when he wrote his What's Wrong with Sports book okay yep yep, yep. and um, and uh, Milt Josephberg an old uh, Chicago radio host who was a, a big academic uh, was a was a professor at the University of Chicago. And you know would really would would have sports people on, but really wanted the esoteric conversation more so than whatever was in the current standings and stuff. So I mm-hmm. uh, and in my excitement, and it must have been late eighties because in my excitement, I, I talked to Cosell and I said, Holyfield reminded me of Floyd Patterson, and he said, "May I disagree with you, sir? When I see Holyfield, <laughs> really? yeah, oh, absolutely, and it was great, perfect That's Cosell. Good I'm like, yeah, I, oh, thank you. I was, I was, well, you know, radio, I can't help it, man. I always slip into voices. He's like." To me, a fan of Holyfield reminds me of Ezit Charles. And That's I'm so like, interesting. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And then sadly, a lot of parallels. I mean, really fighting fighting above his best weight and having to kind of give away height and reach advantage to, to bigger guys. And certainly, I think, um, you know, Vander, good Lord. I mean, you know, those, those wars that he had uh, with Riddick Bowe and, uh, you know, I mean, well, every heavyweight fight I think was – was a challenge, and again, I think Holyfield was up to it. Uh, but also, even the the post championship years when he continued and stuff, and uh, would struggle against guys that obviously he'd have no, no problem beating in his prime and stuff. But yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And, and the more I looked at the two, and certainly after reading your book, I'm like, wow, I you know I, I see what Cos- I mean. Of course, Cosell knows what he's talking about. But yeah, it was thrilling, and I'm like, oh, that's really it. You know, like okay, the professor just gave me something to kind of research, and so yeah, it was always in the back of my head after that. That is so interesting because I arrived at the same conclusion while writing the book that Cosell did. There are so many uh, corollaries between Charles and Holyfield. Uh, one that you mentioned, right, fighting above his weight. Second, he followed a great and beloved puncher. Absolutely. Right? Uh, Charles followed Lewis. Yep. Holyfield followed Tyson. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And there's, an, and there's another one which is even a little more eerie. You remember um, reading the book and there was a time and I, wow, it's been so long since I read it. I can't pinpoint the uh, exact years, but um, when Charles, Charles had failed, allegedly failed uh, a physical because there was some problem with his heart. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And he that's was suspended right. for a while, right? And wow. he was going to retire. Yes. Yeah. Remember after, was it after the, one of the bow fights <laughs> where, uh, it was, actually had this after, it, it, was, it was after Michael Moore, actually. It was after Michael Moore, Michael yes. Moore fight. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Right? It was the first Moore fight, right? You're right. Holy and shit. he had that heart issue when he was going to yes. retire. It's so weird. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, again, more things change, more they stay the same. So, yeah, another reason to pick up Bill's book because uh, a fascinating period, again, that you will find incredibly familiar given the, the, the machinations of, uh, of boxing today. And, uh, yeah, it's just – Again, all Isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah and, and you're right. My God, even down to the, the physical ailments. Well, let's hope Holyfield avoids uh, Ezard's uh, final fate as far as his uh, his health and everything at the end, which is just heartbreaking. And, ugh, you know, I, uh, I, 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 the, I, I've been to Cincinnati. The only thing I saw was when going to the uh, their museum. Uh, it's on Ezard Charles Way or whatever. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad Cincinnati still uh, loves Ezard Charles. Although it's interesting. You would have thought that some Cincinnati person would have written a, an Ezard Charles biography of some sort. Because, God, I mean, how how was his relationship with Cincinnati? Strained. Very strained. Uh, because he grew up in a time of still, of course, where everything was segregated. Sure, yeah. And here he was the heavyweight champion in the world, and he wasn't allowed to go in some places. That's Even as champion. Wow. Um, before I get to more detail in that area, let me say that um, inter- interestingly, uh, in October, there was going to be the unveiling of an Ezra Charles statue in uh, Cincinnati. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it's about time, right? Yeah, and, um, Jesus. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been in the works for uh, several years. Um, the gentleman's name who is uh, spearheading it from a – um, I think I should say from a planning and fundraising point of view is Andrew Van Sickle. And he's been working with the folks over in Cincinnati for all, several years doing this. And in October, they're going to uh, unveil his giant statue of Ezard. And um, I'm hearing that it's interactive. I don't know what that means exactly in terms of the statue. I don't know if you, go, you get to box him or if you jazz him up. It's like this 12-foot tall statue of Ezard. It's about time. And generally, yeah. to be honest, I'm, I'm – 
generally against um, naming streets and statues, erecting statues in the names of uh, dead boxers because if I'd rather they did it when the fighter was alive or well, of course. personality so they can enjoy it, right? But that seems like a thing we only do after they die, so whatever. Um, but that's happening in October, and I'll be out there for the big unveiling. It's going to be a big whole thing in Cincinnati. You know, maybe I'll sign some books and blah, blah. But anyway, um, so yeah, his relationship with Cincinnati was uh, strained because, um, again, it was uh, uh, it was segregated, and uh, he yeah. couldn't go to uh, and enjoy places that some of his uh, white counterparts could. So, um, But certainly it was better uh, than Lawrenceville, Georgia was for him, which is where as it was born and uh, lived until, his, um, until he was about seven or eight. How would you characterize his relationship with um, – and God, now I'm blanking – his trainer, um, the great one. Um, Ray Arcel. Ray Arcel, yeah. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people think that Arcel was Ezard's uh, main trainer, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, Ezard's first trainer was a guy named Burt Williams uh, who trained him as an amateur in Cincinnati. And then later on, shortly uh, on the way to becoming pro, he um, – engaged a guy named Jimmy Brown, a former fighter um, and neighbor of his who became uh, his trainer throughout the rest of his career. Jimmy Brown was his trainer, um, his head trainer for the rest of his career. Arcel was um, hired uh, in preparation for, and I forget now whether it was the Lewis fight or one of the Walcott fights. Maybe it might have been for the first Walcott fight for the uh, championship. But it wasn't until later on that uh, Ray Arcel joined his staff. And it was kind of like, you know, bringing in a, a more team. famous trainer to – yeah, exactly, to, to complement the existing trainer. But Jimmy Brown was the guy who trained Ezard uh, okay. from early in his pro career until the very end. I just remember always uh, hearing Arcel talk yep. about yep. the struggles that they had together and some of the things he was able to do for Charles when he was faced with segregation in that one – Classic story, I forget, before which fight where mm-hmm. couldn't get a hotel or whatever, so they went right. to the army base. Right, the local right. And army. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. you know, and it's like, and of course the army commander's like, we would be honored to have <laughs> Raz right. and Charles, you know, staying with us and stuff. And isn't that great? And uh, yeah, you know, just, and of course, just the usual kind of BS in hotels that, okay, you know, if, if you know, you can't, you can't get, uh, uh, as in a room, I'm not saying, or that they would just, you know, have a right. room in, in Ray's name, Arcel's name, right. and you know, Charles would just kind of sneak in and everything. So yeah, just right. shitty stuff like that. Yep. So so yep. yeah, it's sad that it has to happen posthumously, but that's great. And yeah, I, w- I wonder how the statue is going to be interactive. If it'll be like the Disney World Hall of Presidents or whatever. And then, and <laughs> it might. Be. I don't know. <laughs> That'll that's be fantastic. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, that's nice. Have you seen? Uh, prototypes of the statue? Have, has there been like sketches or designs? Yes, I, I have. And actually, I think the bust is done. And um, cool. the artist whose name I can't recall um, has sent me a couple of photos. And uh, remarkably, in my view, facially, it looks like Ezard. Cool. You know, a lot of these statues look nothing like <laughs> right? Like I saw one of Larry Holmes. He looks like Joe Frazier. And, and one of Frazier looks like Joe Lewis. They never, they never get the face right in my experience. <laughs> But um, this one looks pretty good. It looks pretty close to uh, Charles Feature, so um, kudos to him. That's cool. I haven't been in Caesar's sports book forever. Is that Joe Lewis statue still at Caesar's? I don't know. Okay. Don't... Had you ever seen it? I don't know if you ever saw it. I, I think I recall having seen it once, yeah. Okay. This is you know back in the 90s when I would go to a lot of fights for my sports talk radio station if we were staying mm-hmm. at Caesar's. Yeah, right in, the, right in the sports book. Not quite life-size, but close enough. Yeah. And uh, and a pretty cool statue and everything. And I know for luck and everything, we always touch gloves with uh, Joe before we had our day of gambling. There you go. So that's cool. <laughs> did it work? I, well, some days, sometimes, yeah. it did, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> God, I don't know. Did you catch? Um, I think it was on last week. Uh, Dick Dick Cavett uh, on uh, the Decades Channel. They no. showed they yeah. showed an episode with Jimmy Breslin, Cosell, and Joe Lewis, and it was bef- right before. The first Ali Frazier fight. Cool. And it was really great hearing a 1970 or 71 Joe Lewis talk, you know, about the fight and everything. And yeah. it was, yeah. it was, it was cool. And it's certainly even Breslin and, and Cosell and their thoughts on the fight too. Sure, sure. That's and interesting. It, that uh, oh yeah, you know, and that's the. I mean, God, there's a ton of great Cavits with Ali and Frazier. Oh, yeah. Uh, covering uh, at least the first two fights. I don't. I, I don't remember seeing anything around the time of Manila. But uh, I, I thought That's that was right. Yeah. You know, 
Um, oh yeah, great, great stuff. And even you know, I, I know even uh, after it, I think it, or no, now I'm confusing it because I saw Johnny Carson with uh, Ken Norton after he beat Ali in the first hmm. fight, and that was really fun to see. Yeah, I, I sometimes fall into those uh, YouTube holes also. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> And Dick Cabot, and, and I've seen Norton, not Norton, but Foreman and Frazier on Carson and um, well, have to look Ali with Dick Cabot. They're, they're just great. They're fantastic. Oh, yeah, they're yeah great. man. Got her. I saw one with um, Ryan O'Neill and Hedgeman Lewis, of all people. Nice. And yeah, wow. exactly, man. It's like, oh, that's fantastic. Exactly. It's like it's great to see those kind of fights. And again, this was back when, you know, uh, the, the, the they would be on the evening uh, uh, talk hosts or talk shows and sure. everything. Um, what do you think? And I, and really, I, I don't want you to like, hey, if it's somebody or anything to to necessarily shit on somebody. But what do you think of as uh, the streaming channels have provided commentary shows beyond their coverage? Uh, what do you think? What do you think of some of the shows that we've been getting lately? Uh, Boxing you mean commentary. The, the 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 broadcast crews on the new yeah, streaming. Well, yeah, yeah, just well, just what they're giving us. In, not only during the fight itself. I mean, good. I'll be honest. It's I'm not. I'm not crazy about whoever the zone had. I mean, I like Brian Kenny. I think Brian Kenny mm-hmm. does a fine job doing play by play. But um, oh God, I got to say though, during the Canelo Jacobs fight, it was uh, not to be too rude, but I guess I'm going to be. And this is me saying it. Let me let me put it out there. Uh, they were so up Canelo's butt. It was like watching the propaganda commentator <laughs> during the soccer match in victory, the Stallone soccer movie. And yeah, the, right. the Germans are in top form. It's like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> and Dan to be honest, was in top form, but earlier, like, you know, yeah. Earlier in that show, I thought and tweeted, uh, uh, this sentiment that I was enjoying the three of them working together. It was, uh, uh, Chris Mannix, Sergio Mora, and Brian Kenny. I thought they did a really good job together. But when the Canelo fight started, yeah, Brian seemed um, especially to be in love with uh, what Canelo was doing. <laughs> he had the fight like a shutout, which I didn't see at all. So that, yeah, that was annoying. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like the current um, strategy, if you will, of of uh, networks inviting like all the Showtime fighters go on Showtime and talk in between fights and all these guys come out and everybody gets interviewed. I don't like so much of these fighters talking. I don't, cause I'm, I'm frankly, I'm not really that interested in what they have to say. I'm, I want to see them fight. Agreed. Right. Yes. So I don't like that. I don't like the big pay-per-view thing, uh, where they interview everybody in the crowd and all the stars in the crowd. And, uh, the pay-per-view fight, um, uh, a month or two ago between, uh, Errol Spence and Mikey Garcia. Yeah. Uh, I watched that in the theater with um, my dear friends and colleagues, Eric Raskin and Nigel Collins. And uh, it was, it felt like uh, a New Year's Eve show, the way the (laughs) the thing was produced. I just hated it. I hated it. So uh, while I get that uh, the media wants to make sure that viewers know that these are people, right, and not robots, and therefore we should be able to connect with them emotionally, I'm not really interested in that. You know, I just want to see them fight. I want to see the good fights. I hear and I don't you. really, you know, I don't really care about um, a guy's personal struggles that much. You know, when it was like a, a feature on Sports Illustrated, when we found out stuff about a fighter that we didn't know otherwise, that seemed fine. But now uh, we're just saturated with Danny Jacobs' cancer and Lamont Peterson's homelessness True. and this guy's daughter's got this and yes. this guy's son has that. And I don't, I don't care. I don't care. And I got I, my own shit. I, right? I, I, <laughs> I hear you, man. No, I felt the same way. Uh, one of my last conversations with Bert Trigger was about the 24-7 HBO series. And Bert had a hand in that, too. And I'm just like, it's too much, man. I go, you know, they're they're trying to really make, you know, these uh, very interesting stories. And the, the uh, honest truth is, it's like, yeah, most of them aren't that interesting. Um, yeah, they're, they're not that interesting. And it's, and it's all the same story. And every fighter is fighting for his family, which is, nah, not so much. Most <laughs> Athletes want to get paid and they want to get laid. Okay, that's what athletes are in it for. Kind Same of, as musicians; they want to get was, paid to get laid. <laughs> that's much for their families. You're killing me, experience. but you're right. I, I would agree with you. I think that's true. I also wondered about, and I guess I wasn't asking it uh, directly enough, but like uh, the the not like not the shows that or the f- features we get during a pay per view broadcast or an ESPN two hour card or something like that. I wonder about those weekly half hour shows. Uh, I like Mark, what Mark Kriegel was doing, uh, having the, uh, 
the panel, uh, mm-hmm. and, I, and I can't remember what it was called, and I hope he's still doing it. Um, I haven't seen one yeah. in, a, in a while, and I have ESPN Plus, and I keep looking for those. And the one that bummed me out was, it's funny, I like Dan Rayfield's show when he was just talking. Again, when he would have the interviews with the boxers, uh, sometimes it's, again, these guys aren't the greatest talkers, and it's like, eh, you know, it, it was way too much, you know, a 20-minute interview that I really didn't need to have or whatever. But I, I did appreciate hearing Dan's views on, you know, whatever he thought. Or, you know, I, I, th- I think Dan's one of the better uh, knowledgeable, you know, beat, re- beat reporters that are that are on the beat. And I think Regal does a good job. I'm not crazy about Max's show. Got to be honest. I'm like, all right, whatever. Yeah, I, I can't speak to them because I don't watch any of those shows. Okay. I don't watch any of them. They're none of my business. <laughs> Hilarious. That's okay. I just well, I don't watch any of them. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping for some interesting insider information and everything. And again, I mean, I'm really approaching the podcast as really being, you know, a fan that has too much information. And that's why you. it's like, you know, yeah, it's like straighten me out, guys. You know, tell me, <laughs> tell me, tell me what I don't know. You know, and it's, uh, I don't know. It's, yeah, I got, and, and really, I got to be honest, I think uh, the show's on zone. It's like, yeah, I, I don't think those guys are really up to the task. I, I miss having... Uh, knowledgeable journalists that really do know what they're talking about and really are seasoned as opposed to fanboy shows. And I understand. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, and again, shame on me. Uh, there's a fanboy show right now that you're on, I guess. <laughs> well, it is right. technically, I suppose. <laughs> but, I, but I don't know. I don't I, – I, it's, it's just more fawning rather than, okay, what happened and why or what's going to happen and why. Right. So, uh, I think that uh, – and this has been explored a few times that uh, it seems like um, – uh, not only on the latest design card, but in the past on HBO, for example, the broadcaster spent a lot of time oohing, oohing and eyeing over the A side and what he was able to do in the ring rather than just calling the fight. Oh, yeah. Right. And even calling the fight is superfluous because we can see what's going on. But we'll, we'll take calling the fight if we have to. Right. But just don't spend 10 rounds telling us how great the A side is. Well, again, yeah, I think that was kind of uh, in the in the Canelo Golovkin fights, and I think we did talk about it last time. Yeah, that you know, yeah, there was just too much fawning yep, over yep. Canelo, and not about yep. what was actually happening in front of us and everything. Right. Yep. So that's why I, you know, I always enjoyed watching um, fights on Telemundo and Univision because you I, couldn't understand. I, it, literally, yeah, <laughs> right, for real. Right, right, you know, right. and he just got the fight, yep. and I, a, a Norberto Longo, before he passed away, I got to talk to him. Uh, he they the uh, Univision came or tell yeah Univision came in Chicago to do a, a local card, and I told him I said man I really appreciate your show because you guys not only show you know great uh, Hispanic fighters but you go all over the world and you you collect video uh, from you know Japan and and Australia and and all the uh, all the Asian countries that you know have the lighter weight uh, champions and I'm like. It's the only way I'm able to really keep tabs on the non-glamour divisions is because right. of shows like yours. And he yep. thanked me. You know, it was cool. But, yeah, I mean, because, yeah, you, I mean, that is the beauty of most sports. It's like you don't need the commentators. Just watch what's in front of you and let the yep. thing unfold. Yep. Yep. Absolutely right. Yeah. And that might just be a matter of, you know, us watching for so long. Probably. But generally at this point not going to hear a lot that we don't know already, <laughs> right? So when you've been watching fights for 30 years – Yes. You're not going to hear anything new. Exactly, it's man. Part of it, so, <laughs> so maybe there that there's a purpose that's for younger fans. But um, at this point, uh, what are we going to hear that we haven't heard already? Nothing really. And what am I going to write that I haven't written already, or that hasn't been written already by somebody else? So when you're in it for this long, uh, you know, it's essentially um, everything is not, everything is repeated. Right? How are things going at Ringside Seat? Are you guys? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I I'm enjoying the uh, each issue as they come out and. Uh, Learning more and and really, uh, in addition to ads for your own book and stuff, I love the coverage of uh, the various uh, biographies and uh, boxing books that have uh, been coming out the last few years. I think I think that's terrific. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, your kind words about the magazine. It's coming along over coming along very well. We're very happy with uh, the issues as they come out. Um, and uh, Don Stradley does a great job of uh, reviewing uh, uh, the books. Uh, that we uh, choose to review in the magazine. Uh, he did a great one about uh, a recent Rocky Marciano biography. Yeah. The, the reason that his review was so great is because um, 
it's a fanboy biography of Marciano, and that uh, one that explores that he's a broke, that he was a flawed human like the rest of us are. Yeah, and and Stradley called him called the author out on that, which I love. Uh, uh, so I'm not a big fan of um, mythologizing uh, fighters. Agreed. I'd rather know them and and see them as humans and recognize their faults and do with them what we will after that, but recognize that their faults existed. It's, that, it's a different era now in coverage, right? So on the one hand, I'm saying I don't really care about them uh, as people. I just want to see them fight. And on the other hand, I'm saying, uh, <laughs> which is a complete contradiction probably, <laughs> that uh, I, want to, I want to get to know their foibles and weaknesses. <laughs> right? well, so I don't know. But, but, um, but, but in the case of Marciano, he was an interestingly complex guy as opposed to what we saw and what 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 passed as as you know television and newsreel footage, and he was such a kept to himself kind of guy. He had that he had that crazy uh, uh, celebrity show where he would interview people and right, they'd right, show right. a classic uh, Jim Jacobs owned uh, a fight reel and stuff yep, like that. Yep, yep, so yep. yeah, he you know who knew all the different things. I do you like the Favreau uh, a biopic that uh, they made? Yeah, John I never saw. Oh, okay, because yeah. I don't. I don't... See, I don't, uh, I don't watch boxing movies or uh, really. Boxing. Yeah, how come? Because, well, what's the thing that you know better than you know anything else about? I don't know. Is there uh, is there one thing that yeah, you know well, better uh, than yeah, you know all my nerd all my nerd crap and everything? Sure. I okay. Mean, so well, yeah, you 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 know the subject better, and I, I can appreciate that. I just yeah because the the inaccuracies uh, sure. are just going to annoy me right and it's okay. and I'm not saying because I could do better I'm just it's just because you know things get manufactured a certain way for the sake of entertainment or, or film whatever and that always annoys me I can't get through a movie watching boxing watching a boxing movie and just say okay yeah that's bullshit and that's bullshit and that would never happen and that is completely wrong I so it, rather than be annoyed. By all that, I just would rather not watch it. But then again, I'm not a movie guy anyway. I'm not a big uh, television watcher and, okay. and movie guy. I hear what you're saying. I felt that way about, frankly, the 30 for 30 that uh, Jeremy Shep did on Buster Douglas. And I thought it was fine, but it really kind of – maybe you and I had this conversation already in, a, in our last talk. But I, I'm like, it was kind of like covering a Super Bowl and really only focusing on the winner. And it's like there's reason. I mean, they 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 did some Tyson coverage, and Tyson wouldn't participate per se. But I think there were enough people around the event and Tyson that you could have told Tyson's side of the story of uh, of that that fight mm-hmm. and leading up to that fight. And I just felt like it really wasn't there in the story. And it's like okay, and also that it ended on it kind of reminded me of the Cinderella Man uh, Russell Crowe movie, and that it ended on Douglas winning. And it's like, oh God! I'm like that. It didn't whole... end, yeah, it didn't end on the diabetic coma that followed. <laughs> well, and they, they actually sadly touched on all that stuff. Oh, and I'm really, and I am really glad that you know he was able to uh, do better. You know, get, get get out of that. And it seems like he's leading a decent life. And I and I'm glad to see that. Sure, but sure. but but all of the tug of war over him sure. uh, in the immediate aftermath of beating Tyson and Don King saying, "Hey, guess what? I still own your ass," and yep. just that kind of crazy. Uh, psychological grind that he likely was going through, getting not getting ready for Holyfield and coming in so woefully out of shape, and you know getting knocked out in two rounds as he did. Um, yeah, I don't know. I am like, that's boy, you really, you know. I get, and again, I, whatever. I mean, each documentarian and, and author has their choice of what they want to what they want to cover. Um, so yeah, I, I hear what you're saying because I I've, there was a documentary about uh, John Lennon. And why mm-hmm. why he wasn't you know all the all the trouble he had with um, the Nixon administration and staying in the United States in the early seventies, and uh, it's, it was called the People versus John Lennon, and it was fine. But I'm like, yeah, I know all this. Yeah, okay. Now, see, that's something Checklist. I would watch. You know, oh, it's that's it, something. It, well, well yeah. that sounds interesting to me because that's not my field of expertise. There I would like go. to watch that and learn. I something. hear you, man. Absolutely. Or Edward R. Murrow. I went Bob Edwards, the NPR uh, host, did a Edward R. Murrow biography, and I'd read several. Because I'm such an Edward R. Murrow fan and stuff, and it's like, yeah, no, I was really looking for something new, and it, it just wasn't there. So I can I can appreciate all that. Do you think cool. uh, going as as we go further into uh, this year, are we gonna, you know, I mean, I, the heavyweights, uh, you know, it's like, all right, I guess we're back in marinate uh, mode, yeah, exactly, which is uh, so frustrating. 
It is very frustrating. Uh, our cover story in this newest issue of Ringside Seat uh, is a great feature written by Jason Langendorf about essentially how close we were to really having uh, some really good heavyweight matchups occur and getting an undisputed, more or less at this point, heavyweight champ yeah. and getting some answers uh, from the heavyweights about who's at top. And we were like two or three signatures away. That's all That's all needed to happen. Two or three signatures, not even three, I think. That's like two signatures. And then it all went to hell. Yeah. And we got Deontay Wilder turning down $25 million and uh, and uh, Anthony Joshua turning down uh, $50 million and, uh, and Tyson Fury, apparently because he gave all his money away to homeless people, which sounded like a great idea at the time. Now he's got to get paid to make up for that, uh, that windfall, I guess, that he gave away from the Wilder fight. So he's got to get paid against Tom Swartz. It's just we were so close to um, – having some real fun at heavyweight and and now we're really far away and that's the uh the subject of uh, jason's cover story and it's a really uh, well-written piece uh but it's very depressing i hear you man. we should have been we should be celebrating what's happening in heavyweight now and we're not yeah all that momentum that it seemed like yep. uh, we were getting uh, yeah it yep. seems to have has come to a standstill and god even uh, guys like luis ortiz turning down the chance to fight uh, joshua uh, after, after uh, you know, I got uh, a big baby Miller. I, you know, I got to be honest. I, 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 I think you saw some of my comments on Twitter. I'm just like, man, there's the latest figment of our imagination, big baby Miller. Good Lord. He's the Michael Grant of the 21st century as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he said with contempt. I, you know, he so. said with contempt. <laughs> I just remember yeah. Michael Grant's whole story, and I – Oh, and I again, and not to name drop, but me, Bud Schulberg, and, and Bert Sugar, and our, our Chicago radio host Mike North, and we met Michael Grant, and he walked it away as soon as he's out of earshot. I'm like, "Am I nuts, or is he a figment of HBO's imagination?" And uh, oh yeah, you know, Bert, Bert, and Bud immediately, oh yeah, he's he's yeah, like he means well, but you know, come on, it's like he's a big guy, but uh, you know, he's still he's thinking about every punch he throws, and obviously, while you're thinking about that, a, a straight right hand is going to come right to your face. You know? Yeah. Uh, I have a little story about Grant that's interesting, at least to me. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it, maybe it says something about his mental makeup. I attended his uh, fight with Andrew Galata. Okay, I guess, I guess it was in Atlantic City. And um, after the fight at the press conference, you know, they, uh, the you know, the press is seated and the fighters are up at the table, and um, I think Galata was talking, and. I was watching Michael Grant because I want I like I like to see how people act when they're not the focus of the attention. Yep. Right. I want to see how yes. people react and what they do when people aren't looking at them, or at least when they think people aren't looking at them. It's like watching people when they're not on camera. I'm with right. You. So I'm just like staring at him and he sees me staring at him. He starts staring back at me. And now we're locked. And I'm saying, What the fuck is it? What is this? What is this guy staring at me? <laughs> And so I'm kind of annoyed, and I'm thinking, "What does he want to fight me? What is going on here? Why is he trying to intimidate me? I didn't, I didn't understand it." And I'm at, at one point, I'm thinking about like flipping him off or something. But I'm uh, five nine and a half on a good day, one eighty at the time, maybe, and he's six seven two fifty. And even if he can't fight, he's still six seven and two fifty. Sure, right? But he just kept staring at me until I finally looked away first, and then he looked away. <laughs> Now, what is going on in this guy's brain? He's a ranked, world-ranked heavyweight who just beat Andrew Galata. Got off the canvas to do it, by the way, right? Okay. What does he gain by staring down this white, pudgy <laughs> reporter in press row? You're killing me. I don't understand. I've never understood that. That's hilarious. That's fantastic, okay. man. You see, this is the kind of attitude that comes through in uh, ringside seat in a good way. Yeah, this is like, <laughs> no, I really do. I love the guys that uh, – uh, have assembled for ringside seat, and I enjoy your coverage. And uh, I congratulate you again on uh, the great magazine. And uh, again, check out the free piece. Uh, I'll have the link up at uh, uh, on the on the uh, a post for this uh, episode, and uh, you can check that out. And it's a great introduction to ringside seat. And I'm happy to. Thank you very uh, much. Absolutely, man. Happy to uh, promote the product. It's a good product and everything. And thank, thank you. you for coming back. And uh, I hope you'll come back uh, in a, in a couple months, and we'll have another conversation. It's my pleasure. Anytime. You know my number. 
Bill Detloff. Make sure you pick up Ringside Seat. It is uh, fast becoming one of my favorite boxing magazines and uh, deserves your attention. And also his excellent book, Ezra Charles, A Boxing Life, which you can find at Amazon and uh, most uh, local book chains. So uh, thanks, Bill, for the good conversation. Uh, Final thoughts on uh, the Anton Fuqua Ali documentary, What's My Name? I thought it was excellent. It's uh, it was funny before the documentary started, watching HBO uh, do its usual HBO sports montage of the various things they cover. Uh, boxing sadly uh, missing from that montage, and also I just found it very funny to see Tiger Woods and uh, the twenty four seven logo. And uh, yeah, it's all about golf now. Yeah, let's not let's forget about the fact that uh, 24/7 99% of the time were uh, previews of, uh, of of big fights coming up. Very interesting. But again, HBO's made its choice. It's a different boxing landscape and we're we're all used to it by now. Um but I think it will also color the matchups and also uh, the commentary on the way the sport is presented to us in the months and years ahead. Always fascinating, always has been in boxing. Uh, since uh, the first time that I watched Muhammad Ali fight on ABC Sports when I was a little kid back in the 70s. And um, I was aware of the first Ali Frazier fight, but uh, we didn't go to uh, see it on closed circuit because those were the options back then. You couldn't get it in your house. Um, But we certainly read about it the next day on Tuesday morning. It was a Monday night fight, and I remember being very excited because I was a Joe Frazier guy. And uh, again, uh, pointing to the documentary, hats off uh, to... Fuqua really showing how great Joe Frazier was in that first fight. You can't deny it. I mean, I know Ali protested the loss, but uh, as I've said many times before, no one could beat Joe Frazier that night when he fought Muhammad Ali for the very first time. Uh, He really did fight a perfect fight, and I would stack him against Marciano, Joe Lewis, any great heavyweight, certainly Mike Tyson. Very, very interesting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to watch the uh, What's My Name documentary if you haven't already. But you got my two cents on it. And uh, I'll be talking to uh, guests about uh, the documentary as well in uh, the shows coming up on the Big Bout podcast. So uh, look for that and look for more great coverage. Thanks a lot for listening. We'll talk to you next time. The Big Bout podcast is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019. <laughs>